Welcome to another episode of the Educated Home Buyer YouTube Live. This is where we answer your mortgage, real estate questions so that you can make the best decisions for yourself if you're buying, selling, investing in real estate. When, once again, we have uh, our co host here, Mr. Josh Lewis. Josh, welcome back. I cannot hear a thing you're saying. Is that me or is that you? Well, no, it's just I have too many mics going here and didn't know which one. Can you hear that now? We can. You're good to go. I thought you were enjoying the music so much that you were going to forget to come and join us. I thought you were just vibing to the tunes and we're going to be a little late to start the show. No, no, we're here. Uh, we got a lot to talk about today, a lot to unpack. Uh, we had a Fed meeting today. Uh, we had, you know, bonds bouncing really all over the place, which we're going to take a look at. On top of that, we got some changes in inventory, some changes just in the overall market. And for those of you new to the show, that's typically how we start the show. We like to, you know, kind of go over what's happened over the last week with the economy, with inflation, with rates, with, you know, inventory, how's that affecting house prices, all of the things that you want to know as a buyer, seller, investor in today's market. So we're going to unpack that. And I think, you know, let's let's just start with with bonds, Josh. I think that's a really good place to start. This chart here, I just wanted to throw in, I marked this up. So that uh, is the, the blue wave there kind of shows you the activity. This is just today. So the numbers don't really matter, but we started the day at 98.20. We ended up at 98.31. It's 11 basis points improvement. It means that whatever points you would have paid this morning, you would pay 0.11 points less in the afternoon. So 0.10% cheaper for your rate. But throughout the day, and this is very typical of Fed day, so it's important that no one freaks out and, and sees. So 11 a.m., which Jeb corrected me, I was certain it was 10 a.m., and Jeb said, no, sir, it is 11 a.m. The Fed meeting will be happening today. And you can see right there at 11 a.m., Fed makes their announcement that, hey, we're holding, we're going to pause, we're not going to hike rates, and then boom, market sells off and goes all the way to its worst level, down 29 basis points, or a quarter of a point more it would have cost you for your loan if a lender perfectly repriced there and you chose to lock. But you get back to the end of the day, it's just a long way of saying this is a very typical Fed day when there's not an unexpected reaction or an unexpected movement. It's just always interesting to keep the TV up, hear the talking heads on CNBC, and see that despite all the noise and fury, not much happened today. No, absolutely. And with that, there were a couple of changes um, with the dot plot uh, in the Fed and their outlook, Josh. So why don't you kind of kind of read what's written there? And what I'm going to do is for those of you watching the show, those of you listening, I'm going to update, update the description right now so that you have the slides that pertain to what we're talking about. And that way, if you're interested, you can go download them, take a look at them. And just so you know, we'll show the dot plot next. This is a beautiful, plain English summary of what those dot plots are going to tell you. The dot plots are the voting members' projections of what they expect interest rates to do over the next three years. That was the big change today. The Fed didn't hike last meeting. They didn't hike this meeting. They did come out and say next meeting will be a live meeting, meaning they haven't decided we're going to pause or we're going to hike. We're going to show up. We're going to talk. We're going to vote. We're going to see what happens based on the data over the next month. But the summary of the dot plots that you'll see in the next chart is that their projection is that we're going to end the year at 5.6% on the Fed funds rate versus current 5.1. So they expect two more quarter point hikes between now and the rest of the year. And Jeb, do you know, do we have five or six more meetings this year? Uh, I think we have five, right? So, so we've done so they're January, saying four February, March. We took April off and we had May and June, right? Is that yep. right? Yep. So there should be five more. That means they expect Four two more. out of the next, we get 10 for the year, right? We've got right. Five I so think far. we've done six. I, I don't know. Anyway. Yes. Anyway. So 50, 40 to 50% of the meetings the rest of the year, they expect right now today to raise a quarter of a percent. They adjusted their view for the end of next year um, upwards to 3.4 from previous 3.1. So what they're telling us is that they believe their best guess with what they think is going to happen is they're going to hike two more times for a half percent uh, between now and the end of the year. And next year, they will cut 1%. And we will end up about a half percent lower than we are right now. And there's the fancy chart that shows you all that info. Yeah. And, and and as you go, I mean, you can see there that the blue represents uh, new dots. The old are what was previously there. Um, and it just basically confirms what Josh just mentioned there, that rates, you know, they're expecting rates to 
essentially go higher towards the end of the year, at which point, um, you know, the two more hikes is what they're predicting, at least at the moment. Uh, but we'll look at some charts here on inflation. And, you know, I, I, I don't, I think we'll have a tough time raising and doing that um, if inflation data cooperates, uh, unless, an, un, you know, unemployment. Employment just continues to just be a force out there in the market, which which we're going to talk about. Um, that said, so this is cumulative change in federal funds rate uh, since they started the initial increase of rate. So this increase, what this is the prior to today, they did ten straight hikes, um, and as you can see there, I mean, look at the the line on you know I'm you know for twenty. It's just. Fa higher and faster than any of the last six hiking cycles. So if we go back prior to 1988, maybe there's been something similar to this, but I honestly, I don't think there is. Very aggressive hiking cycle. So uh, again, I watched a lot of smart talking heads on CNBC today take different sides of this. Jeb, you like Steve Leisman. You've talked about him a lot here on the show. Um, and he says, hey, I take the Fed at their word. I think they are committed to breaking something. So they're going to continue until they break something. There was another guy in here, a bond trader, um, guy who makes his money buying and selling bonds. He says, we are aggressively overweighted towards bonds. We have our and our clients' portfolios, 60 to 80% in bonds, 20% in securities at this point, because he's believing interest rates are going to come down. When interest rates come down, if you own higher interest rate bonds, they become worth more. So um, not a right answer at this point. Hopefully, you guys are doing what we're doing here, is just sitting here analyzing and thinking what are the odds? What's the greater likelihood of happening before the rest of the year? I think what the Fed has, has laid out there, Jeb, that half percent between now and the end of the year is our worst case, probably the most likely case, but probably also our worst case. And best case would be no no hikes. Something would really have to break for them to cut in the second half of the year. Agreed. Uh, I love this chart uh, just because it really gives you some perspective on month over month changes in inflation. Um, you can see you know, the far left of that chart there, 0.9. That's what fell off today was replaced with that 0.1 on the far end or yesterday rather on the on the far end there uh, if you have the same replacement next month you, you're replacing a 1.2 so if it's a 0.1 again um that means inflation would be sitting at four percent versus four point I mean three percent versus four point one percent where we sit today so that's a big decrease in inflation um, year over year. I mean, last year, this time, I think 9.1% is where we were sitting. And today we're at 4.1. So um, big changes there. And we're going to take a look at a chart here in just a moment that kind of shows that. So rent, shelter, inflation. This is something we've talked about, hell, for the last six months easily. And, you know, we thought we would see the lag reported sooner um, than we actually have in this chart. And it's taken a while for it to come down. So we know rents have come down. We know housing has stabilized. It's not increasing at the rate that it was, yet the charts aren't showing that. And so as those numbers start to normalize, that will help inflation come down and it will reflect in those numbers and in theory, bring inflation down quicker. So this is you know, 2022, so a year ago versus basically where we are today, right? Um, you can see, I mean, Josh is going to show some stuff here on used cars in a minute, um, which is interesting. Uh, but but the, the things in blue are where you're seeing, you know, the, the big decreases right now versus, I mean, where the blue is now versus the red back then. So fuel, 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 I, I did fuel and oil combined. I made a word. Fuel, <laughs> fuel. Yeah, uh, fuel and gas and utilities and used cars are obviously big, big thing, you know, big um, uh, pieces of the inflation puzzle that have pulled back considerably, which is, is again, helping those numbers come down. But again, I like the kind of the chart across the bottom because it just shows overall where some of these things were versus where they are now. And as a moment ago, we talked about overall CPI being 9.1 versus 4% today. Now, Josh, I don't know if we followed it up with that, uh, the automobile. We did not. So fewer small businesses uh, planning to boost pay, boost wages. What do we have here? The, the key part that I wanted to show is two lines. You see the, the green arrows. Wages are still going up, and that's the percentage. 
it's it doesn't say the percentage of wage increases is the percentage of small businesses planning to increase wages so that trend if you follow that green line is still up and we're still well above what kind of that historical trending upward average is but here from say late 2021 mid 2021 to now it's been pretty much a straight line down so less businesses are planning to raise wages, but still more than historically. And we go back, the only reason the Fed cares about the unemployment rate is they worry that the low unemployment rate will lead to wage hikes and therefore wage inflation, which leads us perfectly into this chart. And this shows a couple of differences here. So the orange line, the one that's continuing to trend up, that's the Atlanta Fed wage growth tracker for the highest earning quartile. So the top 25% of wage earners have not seen any break in their trend higher. The blue line is the bottom 25% of wage earners. They, If you see those lines pretty closely mirrored each other for most of, of time and for a while from 15 through 2022 coming out of the Great Recession, the, the lowest quartile was doing better. Um, now we've seen a big downturn. No one should cry for them. They're still seeing the lowest quartile. Don't look at this and say, hey, the lowest wage earners are really getting screwed. They are still seeing the biggest wage increases. It's just moderating a lot. And, and a lot of that comes down to we've all seen um, fast food employees. Like it's, it used to be we would talk in California and now they have in and outs everywhere. We have in and out in California. Be like, hey, you can get a job at in and out. It's like $11 an hour. Minimum wage is like five fifty. Now, like you go in there, say twin starting at, at eighteen fifty, wages up to twenty four fifty. Managers of an in and out store make way into the six figures. So, um, it, just a, a good indicator there. So this one here, um, supply and demand. We talk about everything coming back to supply and demand. All this is outbound tender reject index. It basically says that truckers. They say, hey, here's a shipment available for you as a trucker to pick up and deliver. Do you want it or not? And that red box there was basically from the start through the heart of COVID. And they were all saying 25% of the time, nope, not interested, don't want that. And now we are down here. The green box just shows you sort of what the low end of the historical range is. We are way down at the low end of the historical range. 2.85% of shipments get turned down. And that may be, hey, it's going somewhere I don't want to go. It's a shipment I don't want to carry. I don't support that business. So uh, shipping freight indexes like this are really good high frequency data that tell us what's likely to come going forward. Now, this one, totally anecdotal. Always be careful when someone goes, here, I have this example. My uncle's brother, sister did this and X. But this, um, I watch Land Cruisers on, on Bring a Trailer. I would like to buy one. I would like to buy a cheap one that needs a lot of work and then make it into one like this. But this thing with sold- With free in, time. In, with my free time. This thing sold in November of 2021 for $77,000. It is a sweet truck. Just came back up on Bring a Trailer. You'll notice the same beautiful truck sold for 56.5 here in January or June of 2023. So 18 months. And it actually, they tried to auction it in December. It was right before Christmas, bad timing. It didn't sell, but was 21,000, $21,500 loss um, on a very desirable vehicle. But that tells you what it actually says that that current price, it doesn't, it's not telling me there's weakness in the economy. It tells me that is probably the fundamental value of that vehicle. And this 77,000 over here, we talk about the excess savings, all the money that was sloshing around in the system post COVID with stimulus, people being trapped at home, even if they got no stimulus, even the rich were trapped at home, couldn't spend money on anything. And they look and go, that's a pretty cool toy. And I got an extra 50 in the bank. Let me overpay for it. And that's that 70. Is, well, 77. <laughs> Uh, so that leads us into inventory. What's happening with inventory? Inventory actually increased a little bit week over week. We went from 436,000 homes to 443,000 homes. Not the increase you want to see. You want to see increases of 3, 4, 5% this time of year in inventory. You're not seeing it. That was a 1.5% increase. Uh, soon enough, we are going to pass under 2022 levels with regards to inventory. That is not a good sign for the market. Orange County, where I'm located, we do it every week. We're sitting at 2,090 homes. Last week, we were at like 2,190. So we're trending the wrong direction with inventory. Huntington Beach, last week, we we're at like 180. Today, we're at 166. Now, one of the guys that I follow tends to think that the, uh, you know, here in Orange County, our market is going to peak with inventory probably within the next six weeks or so, somewhere around 23, 2400 homes. I think that's high at the moment. Um, could it hit it? Sure. I hope it hits it. 
Uh, but the re- reality is it, it may not just because there's not a new, a lot of new listings coming to the market, Jim, which, yeah. Before you move on, let me ask you. So when I look at this, I look at last year that, that arc trended up a lot. And we had talked about that spike in interest rates, put a lot of sellers on, on urgency to, to get their home on the market. Is he just saying that? Because if we look at the typical year, that's about six weeks from now is about where we would normally hit the average. And since rates are, or hit the peak of listings and where we're at right now, um, is more reflective of a, of a typical year with flat interest rates, high, but flat versus last year's. Rapidly yeah. So who I'm talking about there, Stephen Thomas in the OC report. So not, not the same person that put the Altos research here um, together with regards to inventory peaking here in our market around 23, 2400 homes. So um, I think it's just based off how he, you know, his historical um, increases in in inventory this time of year versus what we're seeing now. And he's kind of doing some calculations to come back to his numbers, which at this point, I mean, that means we need to increase, you know, when he did his report earlier this week, we had about a hundred more homes on the market three days ago. Than we do now. So I it's going to be interesting just because there's not a lot of new property coming to the market here. Again, we look at this every week. Historically, what inventory, what does it look like? Um, you know, we we typically see that bounce um, and inventory start to increase, the, you know, during the spring market. We're not seeing it this year and inventory is staying flat and is likely going to turn lower as we head uh, into late summer. This chart is a different perspective, same information, but just kind of gives you a weekly view um, versus 21 and 2022 and just kind of shows you where we are. If you if you go back to the chart two lines ago, it's the same chart here. It's just bringing you a little closer to the nat- the data and showing you um, you know, the numbers on the side and everything just just where where inventory is normally or where it was over the last couple of years. So New listings, we've seen new listings turn up, but compared to the last couple of years, we're still well below those numbers. And that's why you're not seeing inventory grow. This is what I like to throw in here. It just shows that inventory rose, which we talked about. Compared to this time last year, we saw, what, 25, 24,000 homes come to the market during this same week last year. And this this week we saw 7,000. Just shows you you know, in context compared to last year, what things were doing peak earlier this year was at 472. So we're still lower than we were earlier in the year with inventory. And again, we've talked about this one, um, active listings versus homes under contract. Right now we've got 15% fewer than last year. looks like that gap is, um, is growing a little bit less pendings on the market. So that'll be interesting, probably due to higher rates. Um, part of it due to seasonality, people just, you know, out traveling now, kids are out of school, you know, vacations are in effect, just the things that we talk about every year. But now that we talk about them, um, it's, you know, it, it, people don't take it seriously because it's like, no, people aren't doing it because it's too, too expensive or rates are too high. Yes, those are factors, but the other things are real factors. People typically are, you know, have are preoccupied with other things at the moment. Um, we talked about that one. Median home price four fifty four nine hundred. Um, that's for single families here in the U.S. Uh, you can see that's you know that trends trending up at the moment, um, or that 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 line's trending up. Again, median price of homes under contract currently at three eighty three. Not roughly 31% of homes out there have some sort of price reduction on it. And this one is another one when Josh that we like to talk about all the time, just another way to kind of look at that same data. Uh, but it, you know, it's rates versus the 10 year treasury. We talk about that spread. You can kind of see the bottom, that bottom blue area is the, is the, is the primary spread where it's been basically over you know, an extended period of time. And then we look at the green area there. That's where it was during, or oh, is this right? Prepayment risk and three. I, I think the green is uh, taken. Well, no, I don't know. Maybe did I put the wrong chart in here? No, Sorry. they just made a very complicated chart. Yeah, it's 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 more complicated to, yeah, I, never mind. Let's, let's, uh, let's just avoid. But basically it just shows you the, the current spread sitting at at around three percent. So um, 
Where where are my notes on that chart so we can pull it up and talk about it? Just so we have the context on it. Find those. And the, the last yeah. one here is, again, it's more anecdotal. Um, don't pay attention to this. We talk about a lot of good data. This isn't necessarily the best data. The oh, MBS Highway like housing, housing Survey is basically a survey of loan officers around the country of what they're seeing in their market. So this tells you it's a mixed bag, but largely positive. So in the Northwest, activity 61% of them think it's up, 39% think it's down. 34% think there's pricing pressure up, 30% think it's down. And you can look at your area of the country and see there. Most parts of the country, it's uh, slightly positive in terms of activity, probably a two to one margin. And most of them are kind of evenly split. Uh, the Midwest seems to be having more pricing pressure, Northeast more pricing pressure. Um, other parts of the country, depending on where you're at, 30 to 50% thinking there's pricing pressure upwards and, and about 30% thinking pricing pressure downward. So it's anecdotal. It's not super scientific, but it's good info. And then basically, again, that, that chart is showing the, the spread there currently. It's actually at 317 right now, I, I guess the basis points, but this chart's a little off on that. But essentially what it's doing is showing you the last 25 years and showing you what that additional premium in there is being um, accounted for, if you will. And it's that prepayment risk that we've talked about. Um, and then a small percentage of it is other things out there. But as those things start to normalize, in theory, you should start to see rates come down. But hell, we've been saying that for quite some time now, Josh, and we are still here saying the exact same thing. So that said, um, it's now time to answer some questions. But before we do it, I want to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, if you haven't listened to the Educated Homebuyer podcast, it's out there on Spotify, it's on Apple, it's on all podcast platforms. If you like audio, listen to the audio. If you like video, there's a YouTube channel for the Educated Home Buyer podcast that you can go check out. It is uh, the Educated Home Buyer. Um, I will put it in the chat here in just a moment. If you want to go over to that website, subscribe, you know, watch the videos. That stuff helps us, and we appreciate that. On top of that, um, you know, if you find any value in this episode, I would appreciate it if you hit the thumbs up and like the comment, like the comment, like the content, subscribe to the channel as well. Um, also, if you need, you know, an agent anywhere in the country, um, I am happy to make a referral for you. If you need an agent here in Orange County, where I'm located, I, Jeb Smith, am a real estate agent. I would love the opportunity to guide you through that process and help you myself. And if you need a lender to help with pre-approval, have a conversation, see what you qualify for, Josh can help you here on the West Coast. And if he can't help you, we can refer you to somebody else, which we'll put a link up in just a moment. So that said, we are going to flag some questions and jump into the comments right now. So Josh, have you started anything? You have. Let's go in. Have so, I started anything? All right. Maddie. Maddie's uh, one of our regulars on here. Just says, hope all is well. I got my second rental deal in Phoenix this week. Seller financing. Sorry, Josh. Laugh out loud. That's awesome, man. Congrats to you. I want, I would, I want more details. I yeah, love your I, I would love, I would love to hear all about on it. the... Uh, the seller financing. Let us know. Um, yeah, please. So put it in the comments or shoot me an email, Matt. I know you have my email and we can we can talk if, about it. And we can put it out there. If so. you put it in the comments, I would love to know type of property, purchase price, how much you put down and what type of terms the seller carried for. Interest rate, is there a balloon on it? When you have to pay them off? That type of fun stuff. Yeah, good stuff. And how did you find it? That's I'm also curious as to, to that as well. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy, just, you know, some basic comment here, but it's a good comment. Just says, if interest rates go down, home prices should go up. That is very true. Um, I think there are some limits on how much prices can increase at the moment just because of affordability. Uh, but I do believe that prices would go up if rates trended down yeah. enough. Jeb, based off of his uh, profile picture there saying Celtics and something else that he said, I believe he's in Massachusetts. We've got New Jersey David saying if rates come down, prices go to the moon. If rates stay high, no one sells and prices keep going up. If math layoffs happen, they won't. People definitely won't sell ever. Prices ain't going down, only up. So part of this, if we go back to that loan officer survey I just posted, what was the hottest part of the country? The Northeast. You guys are in New Jersey and Massachusetts. That market is hotter than anywhere else. Our market is, is fairly positive here, um, but 
that that kind of reflects what they're seeing. Um, we are actually going to do an episode of the podcast next week, sort of deconstructing the elements of every crash argument that anyone has. Um, they start with kernels of truth and twist and turn it and overgeneralize. We're going to walk through all of that because largely what these two gentlemen just said, or, or women, I'm not sure, ladies, um, is, is accurate. It's supply and demand. Interest rates will improve affordability, increase demand. And then paradoxically, we thought interest rates going up would decrease demand and supply would remain constant. We failed to take into account that most sellers become buyers and that demand for them to buy is gone. So they're sitting on their supply and not bringing it to market. So interesting dilemma. All right. Kevin has a question says with higher saving yields, why would anyone choose to escrow? I'm assuming taxes and insurance. Wouldn't it be better to save your own money for taxes and insurance? Thanks. Um, I will tell you the reason that people do it. One is lenders make the large majority of uh, buyers out there do it. Um, with VA, with FHA, it's required, I believe, Josh. You can confirm that. Um, F FHA is required. VA is not, but most lenders will require it on VA. So if you want to not have impounds, talk to your lender. If you're dealing with a broker, they can potentially shop for one that will not require impounds. Yeah, and then conventional, it's required or it's not required? 10% less, 10 down or less, you can be required to have it. Yeah, so, so the large majority of people, it's required to some extent. Um, that's why most people do it. But honestly, it's the best move for most people. Most people don't budget. And most people don't have a plan to pay this stuff. Um, and when it's included in the monthly payment every single month, it just makes more sense that way. I mean, can I manage my money? Absolutely. Do I escrow? Absolutely. Why? Because I don't like getting a, a $8,000, $7,000 tax bill um, and saying, hey, you got to come up with X amount of money, um, you know, at this particular date. I like paying it every month. Let's be honest. It's not a lot of money. So I'm not going to really earn that much interest on it to start with. So let's let let them deal with the headache of putting it in there. I don't have to worry about late fees, deal with any of that stuff. It's taken care of. My life's easy. So that's why I think the most people do it. Um, and some people just don't know any better. I mean, there, there's also that option as well. Jeb, let's just look at the math of it. So let's say you get 0% interest in an impound account, which they're more like a checking account. It's 0.04%. So they're going to give you like 18 cents a year. Um, and let's say you have the greatest savings account out there that you can get 6%. What are we talking about here? For most of you, you're not talking $1,000 a month in taxes and insurance. So let's say you were $1,000, next month, $2,000, next month, $3,000. Say it averaged 12,000 for the whole year, which it is not. 6% of that is what, four or 500 bucks? Um, and the reality is the pain in the butt factor of that is vastly outweighed by it. So remembering that most of those high yielding accounts are going to require you to lock it up longer. You can get four, four and a half percent without locking it up. But that average balance is going to be more like three, four thousand throughout the year, even for someone with a thousand dollars a month of property taxes and insurance. So for most people, what are we talking about? Five, ten dollars a month of interest they're giving up on. Uh, it's just not worth the headaches. All right. Good stuff. Uh, Mike says, can I cancel the deal if I remove the contingency? How long do I have to cancel it? So not really a full question there. Um, you can cancel it if you've removed some contingencies. And if you've removed all your contingencies, can you cancel? The answer is yes, but your deposit's going to be at risk. Um, you can always cancel a transaction before it closes, but there's <laughs> repercussions um, involved in those situations. Here in the state of California, the California RPA is the only one that I know. So if you're outside of California, can't I can't tell you for certain how all of this works. But what I can say is here in the state of California, you got, you know, 17 days the way the contract's written to release your contingencies, to do your due diligence, if you will. If at which point you do your due diligence, you say, I'm moving forward with this property, you cancel those, uh, you know, you cancel, you, you remove your contingencies from the property. After that point, you decide that you don't want to move forward. You you want to cancel your deposits at risk at that point. Can the seller say, you know what? I'm not going to take it. You can keep it. Sure, they can. But they can also say you release your contingencies, at which point that deposit's mine. You can argue it. You can do whatever, at which point, you know, if you sign the arbitration part of the, 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 the agreement, then you got to deal with it and or go to court and whatever. But the reality is you'd lose the money because you've essentially release contingencies. So 
Um, but say in the case that there's six contingencies or seven or whatever in, in a contract and you've released, say, the appraisal and the loan, um, but you haven't re released the home inspection and then you want to cancel. Well, chances are you could still cancel because you have that home inspection contingency in place. You just got to, you know, use that um, in the way that it's written in order to get out of the deal. So hopefully that's helpful, but talk to your agent. Your agent should be able to guide you through that process and should support your decision, um, whichever direction that it goes. Uh, Heidi, Heidi, Heidi looks like a real estate agent. I don't know, uh, but says, do you think today's interest rate announcements will impact uh, inventory and prices? Do you think? will have any impact on inventory and prices. No, not really. I mean, um, I don't, yeah, let's, I, let's, let's, I mean, let's look at the could it have an impact? With. Sure, but I, I just don't think that's the case. Well, Jeb, look at the chart we started with. It, granted, today's only one trading day, but we started the day where we ended. So what the Fed does and is what we talk about repeatedly week after week after week. The Fed does not directly impact mortgage rates. They did nothing today and nothing happened in interest rates. So I guess today we could say they impacted it, um, but I don't expect it's going to make much of a difference. No, agreed. All right. Uh, just... On here, there's oh, I'm in the wrong side, so I'm like, well, where's all the flag questions? Uh, Josh, Maddie, easy one. Go, I'll go back to it. I was gonna say, Maddie came through with the details. What when do you think rates will be under five percent? Can't really say, but is five percent something you see in the next six months? No, no, I expect a more of the same. We talked about this. Go back to last week's episode of the podcast or the one we published last Tuesday. Um, where Jeb and I kind of differ on this. I think we are going to see a slow grind lower through the rest of the year. Um, so what does that mean? Are we a quarter or a half percent lower at the end of the year? Still only get you to the mid to low sixes. Um, I think it's going to be next year before we see rates in the fives, much less at 5%. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think, again, you could see rates higher for longer. I, I think, I think what we're seeing right now is, is kind of the norm for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, just because, the Fed is playing hardball um, and uh, it's, you know, it's obviously creating volatility in the market and volatility isn't good for rates. That said, Maddie says $200,000 purchase, $10,000 down. Uh, it's a two bedroom, two bath, co two bath condo, interest only, 7%, 10 year balloon, no prepayment penalty, filing the NLS through my agent out there. So only put 10K down on a $200,000 property. So that's one one ninety. So what's that property rent for, uh, Matt? So you doing the calculations there, Josh? Yeah, just to give everyone here an idea. So one hundred and ninety thousand IO at seven percent. You're looking eleven hundred bucks a month. So you're gonna have taxes, insurance, HOA on top of that. So maybe fifteen hundred all in. I'm gonna assume in in Phoenix Metro, you're probably paying more than fifteen hundred bucks a month rent, right? Yeah. Yeah. In theory. So be interesting to see, see where that comes out, but in escrow. So congrats on that, Matt. Um, uh, how many first time home buyers are you guys seeing close in orange County these days? So I only know the borrowers that I'm working with, right? So I have one signing loan docs either tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, we had one close, uh, first time home buyer that's closing or that closed what last Friday, Josh. Um, so that's two, they were first time home buyers they are closing. So I don't know the number. Um, but you know, it's, you know, the, the, the existing home sales report that comes out of uh, national association of realtors, I think has first time home buyers sitting somewhere around 30%, um, give or take. A percent or two, I think that's probably pretty accurate for most markets out there. Um, even in high priced areas, I think a, a good majority of those are still first time home buyers. Any thoughts on that, and Josh? I, I would say personally, anecdotally, 80%, 90% of my business is in California. The rest of it's all Western United States. It's probably closer to 50% for me, but that's more of a statement on me and my clientele and where we're marketing and what we're doing here um, versus where the market's at. So that 30% is probably accurate. No. All right. Well, yeah. It, it, hard to say for sure. Um, let's see. Could you please help me with a lender? I am in Virginia. I am getting conflicting advice. So uh, Ma Lissa would love to help. So, you know, earlier I mentioned this link. I didn't put it up there, but if you need a lender in, you know, Virginia, anywhere in the United States, um, even here in California, use that link, get in touch with Josh. Josh can't help you in the 
the states that he's licensed in. Um, I have it sent out to a referral network that can guide you through that process. Um, really good people, you know, top notch people that know what they're doing, uh, guide you through the process and, and take good care of you. So that said, my mouse is stuck, Josh. So you're going to have to help me out. So here, let me throw a series that we can clear out here. Susie Vidal has three three questions or a series of comments. Uh, hey, still waiting for interest rates to drop or home prices to drop. Um, easy kind of answer there. We're not going to get both. Um, you know, if, if interest rates go up, you may see home prices drop. If interest rates come down, it's going to be supportive of prices. But the next question here, Jeb, uh, she asks, uh, are banks that are credit unions giving better interest rates? Sometimes, not necessarily as a rule, most smaller credit unions are not portfolio lenders, meaning they are not lending depository funds. So at that point, they're glorified brokers. So you're dealing with a bank teller who's handing it to the processing center at a broker or an independent mortgage bank and handling your loan. You're just adding another middleman in there. They may offer you very good terms because they're not necessarily looking to make a huge profit on that loan. Um, but shop. That's the only way to know. There are some credit unions out there with really good terms. The majority of them have mediocre. Most of them won't have bad terms for you. And then the last wildest one here, Jeb, this one's for you. Should I lose all hope of buying this year? Is Florida any better than California? And then actually then follows up as far as interest rates. Interest rates are incredibly consistent. Um, there are some state adjusters, but they're very small. So for the most part, wherever you buy, interest rates are going to be the same. But how about the other part of that, Jeb? I don't really have a comment. Um, I, you know, pros and cons to each. Uh, is Florida better than California? I mean, California for a reason. Um, it's not the politics. I can tell you that. Uh, it's not the taxes either. I'm not here for that. I'm here. Well, let's be honest. I'm here for the weather and the weather, quite frankly, sucks the last six months. So I don't know why I'm still here. Maybe next week I won't be. Hmm. How about that? Um, no, there's, how about, there's pros and cons yeah, to each. Other part, Jeb, forget Florida versus California. Should I lose all hope of buying this year? Should I just throw it, throw in the towel and say, I, I can't buy this year? I, I don't know your financial position um, or where you stand in the process. I, I, I vaguely remember some comments that you've put on videos and husband situation and some of the other things that you're, you're talked about. Um, no, you shouldn't lose hope, but you also shouldn't be uh, put yourself in, in, in this false hope that prices are going to come down and rates are going to improve significantly so that you can afford a home. And I don't want that to sound negative, but in all reality, neither of those is going to happen. So, you know, adjust to the market. You either can or you can't. And if you can't, what can you do to improve your situation for being able to do it next year? Um, you can work on your credit. You can work on your down payment, move to a more affordable area. Those are all things that maybe you consider in order to make that happen. Uh, but don't lose hope. You know, what's and the... Hope is all we, what's the, what's the saying? Don't lose. It's out of what movie? I can't Look, think. Uh, you're coming with fancy stuff. I oh, it's, uh, the da, 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 in jail. He's, uh, I don't know. I forget. You should, you should get Shawshank Redemption quotes Shawshank Redemption. Yes. What, there what we go. Say? I don't know. Some about hope. <laughs> Someone, someone's going to comment and tell us what it is. Yes. Let's, I could Google it and, and while we're on here, but that's not as fun. Let somebody all let, portion. Let, of the show with a simple one. Should I do a 15 year or 30 year? For most people, especially first time buyers, it is not an option. From what you've told us, you're worried you can't do it. Should I do it? Am I gonna get priced out? A 15 year payment is gonna be 20 to 30% higher than a, a 30 year payment. Um, probably more than that. I haven't looked at them recently just because we don't have a lot of people during a refi market. A lot of people look at a 15 year. Most people purchasing won't do it. Probably not an option. Talk to a loan professional. You know, Josh, you I can read data and I can remember the numbers, the like all of that stuff. I can repeat it, no problems, no yeah, thoughts, whatever. I can watch a movie a thousand times and I can't repeat a, a one liner out of it to save my life. I have people, friends that like just quote movies back and forth. And I'm like, you, you people are weird. Like that you could just have these conversations like about a movie. I am not that person. I can see a movie and have no idea what was said um and, and much less be able to repeat it in 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 any you know so any Jeff, form, and much less years later but are you saying it's just, weird then that one to two days a week when i walk out the door my wife says bye buddy and i say hope you find your dad is that is that weird no idea where that came from what movie it's have you from, never watched it's elf like, it's one of the greatest movies of all time. I have seen it, but I tell you, I, I've seen it probably in... 50 times. Yeah. But I don't like. 
None my of that wife and I have probably 20 different movie quotes that we just cycle through on a regular basis. Yeah, Jeff, no. we got a, we got a good fun question here, and it kind of oh, relates to some things that I you know. and I are doing. Yeah. Yep. ZV Edwards says thoughts on entering the rental property business. And I'm, I'm thinking she's asking the investment property business, buying real estate for investment during this market. What are your thoughts, Jeb? Are, I think are it's a great idea. Considering uh, it? Would you be open to it? Yes. Um, I think it's a great idea if the numbers make sense. It always rent. The thing about investment property is it's really easy to figure out one way or the other. It either makes sense or it doesn't. Right. People buy a, buy property emotionally. They justify logically. And I say that in single family homes primarily, right? If you go from the residential business to the commercial business, it's a different world, right? Because residential is very emotional. People buy things because they they have a feeling or something about it, or it makes them feel a certain way or whatever. Commercial, you know, people, when they, they buy commercial properties, they lease commercial properties, it, they're doing it because of the numbers. The numbers make sense or the numbers don't, right? It's giving them some sort of advantage you know, whether it's taxes, whether it's, you know, owning the building and appreciate whatever it is, investment property is very much the same way. It shouldn't be about emotion. It should be about do the numbers make sense on paper? Can you get positive cash flow if that's your goal? Maybe your goal is not cash flow. Maybe it's appreciation. And you're looking in a state where you're looking for properties that are going to appreciate long term and you're willing to forego that cash flow to some extent in order to reap the rewards of appreciation. Those are the things that you got to figure out. Now, where Josh was going with his is Josh and I are now buying properties, um, single family homes, and looking to, we're looking for people that that want to sell, want cash offers, want to um, get an investor involved because they need to sell for some reason or another, right? Uh, maybe they want out. Maybe they are looking to, um, you know, I don't know, whatever. Right. That's what we're so, looking for. So if you know somebody, some type, let us know. Yeah, some some type of urgency or distress. Yeah. And that's that's my answer in a market like this where prices are high. If you have the seller who has a pristine property and no motivation to sell fast and you pay top of market in most markets around the country, you're going to have a very hard time with cash flow. So if you're doing a 1031 exchange and you have a middle of the road property and you exchange it into a top of the line property and you're comfortable with the numbers today, that's one thing. But if you're entering into the market, um, to me, the only way to make it make sense is motivated sellers, distressed properties, something that you can get a discount. You can add an ADU. You can renovate the property. There's, It's just the turnkey I'm going to buy out of the MLS is really difficult. So Maddie came back and said that property rents for 1650. So with an interest only loan, he's going to be about 150, 200 bucks a month positive. That's fairly thin margin, but it's a lower price property. Um, he owns other property. He's familiar and comfortable with that. So um, it's going to be really hard to find a home run deal out there right now. Not impossible. If you go on some of these investing forums, someone every day is getting a smoking deal on an investment property. They're just fewer and further between and you're having to look for distress. So that's why what Jeb and I are doing, um, looking for folks who are wanting a cash offer, need to close quickly, can't have repairs, inspections, all of that fun stuff. So again, if you know anyone with a, a, a terribly awful, ugliest home in the neighborhood, let us know. Yeah. And then Platinum Black says, you know, please leave some homes for the rest of us uh, or for the rest of us guys. Yeah. Look here, the homes that we're buying or, or trying to buy aren't homes that most people are going to be able to get financing on, um, aren't, aren't homes that most people are uh, willing to even accept financing on because they're looking for some sort of quick time frame or what have you. So we're not really your competition um, unless you're a cash buyer, in which point we could be. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, if you know somebody, let us know. And we're uh, happy to help. Jeb, Kim, Kim <laughs> answered for you as to why you live in California. And the more, the more we get out of Kim, the more we learn, there's some, there's some wild stuff going on at Kim's house. Uh, that's too funny. Uh, weather, women, and weed. You I'm going to go weed, hang out with It's not with, really my thing. Um, women aren't anymore either. You know, my wife said no to that. <laughs> so my wife said, go over to Kim's house and stay away from me. Yeah. And so I just got the weather, um, which is really disappointing lately. So that said, um, platinum blacks trying to buy your property in, in orange. Sorry. I just, my thought <laughs> changed here. I'm Make trying to get him to sell it to you. I can't refuse. I'm, I'm still trying to get him to sell it to you. Okay, guys, we're going to move along here. Uh, we are 544 in. If you haven't done so already, 
hit the like button. Um, if you find any value in this content at all, share it with a friend. Find somebody you know that is buying a house, investing in real estate, selling a house that needs assistance, wants some guidance. We would love to be those people. Again, we do this free of charge, you know, trying to invest in the community, provide some value. Um, and in turn, it helps us, you know, reach our goals. We do have goals with this whole thing. Um, one I have is to hit 100,000 subs on this channel. Uh, the other is I would like to do this honestly, like full time. I would like this to be a big percentage of, you know, my job, educating people, guiding them through the process because I feel like there's a lack of it out there and you guys help support it. And for that, I'm very grateful. So thank you. That said, there's a link also scrolling yeah. if you need a lender or a realtor anywhere in the country. Yes, Josh. Darren knew what movie we were talking about, even if you can't remember the quotes. Oh, there you go. I mean, look at that. There, you know. I got at least one of the audience with me on my Buddy the Elf quotes. Oh boy. Here we go. Here we go. Um, let's see. I'm looking for some good questions. Bill says, are there people that can help us find cash flow rental properties in our area? Do realtors offer this or do people need to do it on their own? No, there are realtors that should be able to help you find cash flow properties. Now, let's be honest. Um, you came to me, and if you came to me here in Southern California and you said, Jeb, find me some cash flow properties, I would say, we first we need to talk about how much money you have to put down before we can start talking about cash flow properties. Um, because you know, putting the minimum down here in California, you're not going to get cash flow properties. You need to put upwards of probably 40, 50% down in a lot of areas here in California to break even on properties, much less get them to cash flow. Now, that said, there are areas of the country where you can go buy a property putting 20, 25% down and, you know, on a $200,000 home, 50 grand or so, and get a nice cash flowing investment. Um, in the case of Matt, Matty here, he put 10%. Now, he put 5% down on the property, 5%, 10%. 5%. 5% down on a property in Arizona was able to get seller financing and it cash flows, um, you know, without factoring in any other expenses that could arise. So there are opportunities out there, but you can find an agent to help you with it. You just need to find somebody in your market, right? Um, and if you need somebody in your market, send me an email or something and I'll see if I know anyone in your market that might be able to guide you through that process. Well, Jeb, Bill has a follow-up here. He yep. says, I expect to pay finder's oh. fees. I'd be looking in Tucson, Arizona. So if you're buying out of the MLS and you're looking with a realtor, you're not going to pay a finder fee. You're not going to pay anything. Your realtor is going to get paid from the other side of it. What you're really talking about, you need to find investors that are wholesaling properties in the Tucson market. And what I can tell you, most wholesalers also flip themselves. Either they're, they're entry level, they're new to the game, they don't have any money, they don't have the experience of running a project, so they just want to make a quick buck. They're going to mark up whatever they get under contract uh, and you give up a little bit of the discount that they've negotiated. But what I can say is the experienced flippers that are also wholesaling, if you get a home run that's $100,000, $150,000 profit, you're going to keep that. The ones that you're going to let go are fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 profit. So if you're looking to flip, that may not be a great deal. If you're looking to buy and hold, that fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars discount to market is going to go a long ways towards helping you cash flow wise. There you go. And I actually have a really good agent in Tucson too, if you need one. So um, you can send me an email or you can go through that referral link at the bottom there and I will connect it. Um, jo Joan says, is there any truth to the bill that Joe Biden passed about buyers having low credit scores getting a better rate? Josh, is that true? <laughs> Wasn't a bill, uh, the FHFA, uh, the director of the FHFA that was appointed by Biden uh, told Fannie and Freddie that they had to change loan level price adjustments. So there is some truth to it. I'm going to post here in the comments the actual episode of the podcast that we did, 30 minutes, giving you everything you need to know if you want to check it out. There you go. Make sure you change your uh, the, the person commenting on the bottom there so it doesn't show up in like 14 different places. Um, you, you don't want everyone to be able to find it. What if someone else wants the answer to that question watching on another channel? Well, then go for it, Josh. Go for it. Uh, let's see. Josh, what is going to cause the 3% spread to go down? So what we're talking about here, we talked about it at the beginning of the show. There's a spread between interest rates and the 10-year treasury. Typically, what you can do is you can take the 10-year treasury Historically speaking, you can add about 1.7 to that 10-year treasury, that note, 
and it'll give you interest rates. It'll give you about where 30-year fixed rates are at that time. What we've seen is that tr that spread has widened um, due to uh, prepayment risk out there in the market and, you know, and it's continuing to widen. Um, and, and the reason there's this prepayment risk out there is because the servicers that are buying these, 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 uh, uh, mortgage backed securities believe that interest rates are going to trend lower. Therefore they don't want to pay, um, you know, market value, quote unquote, market value for these um, because a lot of people are going to refinance if and when rates come lower. So, Josh, what causes that spread to go down between now and then? Here's here's part of the worry. Like right now, they believe interest rates are going to come down. If we actually see start see rates start coming down and they're going to see prepayment speeds increase, we would have to get to a level where they expect them to remain for a period of time. I wish I had the quote. Um, it was a, a really highly esteemed bond trader was um, put it into perfect words. And what he expects is that treasury yields will decrease first and fastest. And at a certain point, investors will say, you know what, I'm not getting the yield that I want in treasuries. I will start paying up for mortgage backed securities, despite the fact that they have this duration risk and prepayment risk that treasuries don't have. So overall, the thing that's going to bring the spreads down is a downturn in interest rates and flashing back earlier in the show, Neither Jeb nor I think that we're going to see that happen anytime soon. So I would expect this wonderful temporary feature of the market to be with us for at least the next six to 12 months, hopefully narrowing a little bit, um, but we will see. All right. Rack pull above the knees. Can I represent myself in a transaction without a buyer's broker, even if the seller is represented by a seller's broker? So here in the state of California, the answer would be no. What would happen is the seller's agent would end up representing you as well. Um, earning more or less both sides of the commission there. You can't go in without representation in these situations. Um, otherwise, you just get represented by the other side. I, I, I never had, I don't know that be the formal way to put it, but I, I believe that to be 100% accurate. Josh, are you under any other... You know that one I, I'm not familiar with. I wasn't I wasn't going to challenge you or say that you're wrong. I was just I was surprised by by the fact that I couldn't go in and say, hey, well, you don't have the I contracts, don't... you don't have the disclosures, you don't have like as a buyer without representation, you don't have the items necessary in order to put the offer together. And I think that's first and foremost that that's probably the biggest issue. Just play it, play along at home. Say I'm an experienced investor, unlicensed. I find the home. I go into an open house over the weekend and I call you up and I say, Jeb, I was at your listing this weekend. I do not want you to represent me. I want to buy that house. Here is my offer. Please present it to your sellers net of what the commission that they had agreed to pay, which again, not necessarily how it works because that your listing agreement says there's a total commission. If there's no one to cooperate with, you don't have to cut that, mm -hmm. but that's what I would ask you to do. And I'm assuming from there, you could say they agree with your terms. I need to write it up on the California Association of Realtors form and we'll go from there. And you would disclose I am not representing you and I have no legal obligations to you. I think in theory it, it could be done. It would be incredibly rare and unlikely to happen, but I think it could. No, I mean, I'm not challenging. I, you know, I, that's why I asked the question. I started thinking as I was talking and thinking, is it possible? I guess it's possible. I just, you would be doing yourself almost a disservice to some extent. I mean, you're better off negotiating, you know, you lose all, um, you know, by, by having the agent represent you, you take all the potential liability you have of representing yourself and almost put it on someone else, um, you know, in, in that situation. And you, you know, you're able to get the I's dotted T's crossed, that sort of thing. Um, by having representation and making sure that you're protected on that side. Whereas as an individual, something happens there, you didn't do the job properly, then you're essentially at 100% risk of, of taking that on versus having a broker, someone's licensed, E&O, liability, all of that stuff to take the responsibility. So 
Again, maybe, maybe not. I, you know, kind of going back on my answer there a little is bit. It, is it technically possible? Probably, I guess would be our answer. Is it uh, practical? Is it reasonable? Is there enough of a savings there to make it worth your Am while? Am I recommending it? And the answer is no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's not because, I mean, I'm not, I have no skin in the game representing you at all, but I would say you're better off having somebody represent you and just negotiate. If commission is your thing for whatever reason, then try to negotiate it and see if you can get somebody to work with you, especially yeah. if you're finding the deal. Jeb, we get this one a lot here. So Mike says, I'm not happy with my loan officer. I already removed my contingency. Can I get my loan from somewhere else? It's been 10 days now. So if you're 10 days into a 30 a day escrow, 20 days would be enough for us to get your loan done and closed on time. Mm -hmm. Can you do it? Yes, you can do it. Have you paid any non-refundable fees? Did you pay for a credit report? Did you pay for an appraisal that's already been completed? Um, it, it is absolutely possible. What I will say, um, you guys probably get tired of me sounding like a broken record that please don't get yes. on the phone and call eight people and say, what's your interest rate and go with the person with the lowest interest rate. I am dealing with a buyer right now, referred to me by a realtor, not by Jeb. And from the very first phone call, she made it very clear that all she wanted to know is what my interest rate was. And I said, ma'am, I don't even know that you guys qualify. The price range you're telling me and the income you guys make, it is very questionable. So we may that may dictate which program we have to go. Rates can vary 1% from the type of the best pricing that I would be thinking of to the worst. So she says, okay, I'll do it. Send out the application. We'll get everything started. Send it out. Didn't hear from her. She didn't answer a week ago. Followed up again. And things day, I found a much lower interest rate. So we're going to go with them. I got her into a conversation, come to find out they don't even come close to qualifying for what they want, but she found a lower interest rate. So what I would say is just be very, very careful with how you're going about this. Talk to people, find someone that you are comfortable with, go through the process, find out what you qualify for, why that's the best program and have it explained to you. Hopefully you're all on the same page. This is it. And if you want to shop now, you know, Hey, FHA is best for me. What are the best rates out there? And unless it's significantly better than the person that walked you through that process and helped you figure out what, which was the best loan for you, I wouldn't make that change. Most reputable lenders should be within about an eighth of a percent of each other on interest rate, maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars on cloth costs. That's not an insignificant amount. But what I will tell you is I get questions and comments like this all day, every day of people who are miserable, unhappy, not getting communication, not getting what they told, don't qualify for the loan program that they were sold please go for expertise first. Make sure you're getting good terms, but get with an expert. There you go. Good stuff. Um, Josh, when you said that, made me think of something. Uh, my video that's coming out this Friday is on FHA. You know, the, the video that I have out there on how much you can afford if you make fifty to $75,000 of income is doing really well out there. Uh, I don't know how many views it has, a couple hundred thousand. Um, I, I repeated that same type of video, but did a lower income, 25,000 to 50,000. If you're Ooh. in that price range Ooh. and trying to figure out what you can afford, I've done the math for you. Um, check it out. It'll drop on Friday morning. So, um, you know, watch it, comment, let me know what you think. Where, um, where, do, they, where do they move to Jeb to find these properties? What States were you finding them in? I didn't, I didn't look up States. I just said, Hey, if you make this amount of income, this is essentially the, the price range that you in theory should be looking at. Um, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't go the extra step and give them States because clearly a lot of people watching they, all over the country. And they could be, so, yeah, they could be anywhere. Yeah. Um, J flow beats, uh, beats. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, is it still a seller's market seller, which I'm currently in contract with contract with does not want to fix or credit any repairs that were found on the inspections of the home. Is it a still, is it still a seller's market was the original question in our market? The answer is yes. Um, is it a seller's market like it was in 2021? No, it's not. But because of the lack of inventory, Sellers still have the upper hand in a lot of markets out there. Real estate is local. Maybe not in your market, in the market that I am, that's where the, you know, where we are. Um, I, I know there's a lot of markets out there a lot like where we are and experiencing the same thing. That said, you know, what I would say is, you know, how many offers were on the property when you submitted it? How long was it on the market when you submitted your offer? Was it a multiple offer situation? If it was and you ended up paying more or whatever then chances are they could put it back on the market. You don't perform and they could probably get another offer. Um, in which case the market was the property's on the market for two months and you were able to put in a lower offer, get it accepted. Didn't really have any competition. You, you probably have more leverage in your negotiation. It's all about understanding your position versus the seller. What's their motivation? Are they in contract on something else? 
Do they have to sell? Do they, you know, where are they in the process? Are they moving? Are they already packed? When you go into the house, are all the boxes already ready to go? They're just waiting. That's the things, the stuff that you need to be looking for in your negotiation because you can say, hey, listen, you know, you don't have to tell them, but hey, I know where you are financially. I mean, you're in a position where you got to do this. You got more leverage on your side in, in trying to get those things done. But use your agent, assuming they're a professional. Um, if they're not, then you probably needed another one. But at this point, um, let them guide you through that process and, and give you the direction to go. But I would say it's a negotiation, right? There's some give and take. They said no. They probably want to see what you're going to come back with. So now you come back with the same thing. Come back with the same offer. Come back with more. Ask them to paint the house and see what they see what they do. Then they probably agreed to the minimal stuff that you were willing to do. I'm being facetious a bit, but uh, you know, negotiate hard, draw your line in the sand, and and once you reach that line, stick to your guns. And if you can't, then move on. Find another property. Uh, Josh. Import, importantly, before you take that one down, if JFlow Beats is in the business of creating and offering beats, maybe he could make us a show intro so we don't have to hear that wonderful music you've been torturing us with for the last few weeks on the intro. Fair. That's fair. That's, you know, that's what, you know, the $15 that I pay Epidemic Sound for, that's the best they give me. You know, so if you got something you some, want to make, we need some. We need some custom tunes, both for the show here and for the podcast. So if J Flow Beats can come through with that for us, you're just see now you're it. stereotyping just because of the username. He's just, probably not even here yes. anymore. I go with beats. Probably when not I hear even beats, here anymore. I hear he's a beat maker. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong. Uh, but guess what, guys? It is six o'clock. That flew by. Um, you know, if you would like us to do another episode, another day of the week. Let us know. I would love to know what you think. Um, and if so, what time? Would you like it earlier? Would 4.30 work? Would a 4 o'clock work on some days? No. We can get takeout, have lunch, and answer questions. We could do that, but a lot of people are at work. I'd love to know what you think. Um, that said, guys, you know, appreciate you being here. If you need an agent anywhere in Orange County, I would love to be that person for you. Reach out. Let me guide you through that process. Make it easy and smooth. Uh, if you need a lender, contact Josh. Uh, that referral link there, scroll in the bottom, will get you to him. If you need a realtor, agent anywhere else in the country, use that link. It'll get you there as well. Listen to the Educated Home Buyer podcast on YouTube. Subscribe to it. I think we're at 1,150 something subs. Uh, they just lowered the sub count, by the way, on YouTube. So now you only have to have 500 subs and 3,000 hours of watch content in order to uh, monetize. But because but of you guys, it'll, we it only that. opens up some features. So we got all features because you guys subbed 1,000 plus subs. Yeah, and for that, we're appreciative. So, Josh, I'm going to throw it your way tonight to lead us off. Uh, it's an interesting market, not easy for anyone, for your professionals, for you out there navigating it, trying to buy, sell, finance. Um, just trust your gut. Do your research. Show up here. Don't just listen to us. Listen to anyone that you trust and believe in. Um, if we can help in any way, as Jeb always says, reach out, um, whether we can help you directly. I know Jeb talks to people in other parts of the country all the time that he can't help directly. I do the same. So uh, you don't have to be in a state where we can actually do a loan or close a home for you. We're here to help. So reach out. Let us know what we can do. All right, guys. Until next time. Adios. And via con Dios. <laughs>